Awesome. Well, let's pray today it comes out okay. Um, we're going to start with an algorithm today. We love algorithms in mathematics because there's no thought required. It's, if it looks like this, do this. We don't have a lot of them, but I'm going to give you a simple one that a lot of you did in linear algebra. Do you know any algorithms? Really important one. Simplex. That's an algorithm because that means there's only one way. You don't have choices. It, you do this. Another one, the Gram-Schmidt Gram process, is that you're given the set of vectors. You don't have a choice. You start the process. You do it this way. Everybody gets the exact same answer, basically in the same number of steps. That, we like those kind of things. What we don't like is if there's more than one route, and now i got to choose the route. Or you're doing integration in calculus, and there may be more than one method or substitution that applies. There are problems like that. We don't like that. We want the one where the route is absolutely clear. So I want to find, uh, we're going to use GCD now because we're in high level math rather than GCF, okay? So the notation that we used when we were little kids, and I want to walk you through because I want to make sure we understand what our goal is, not just the how-to. I want to find the GCD, I wish I brought one. No, I did not bring a calculator, darn it. Okay, I want to find the GCD um, hold on a second. Of 1008 and and 1296. There, yes, yeah, exactly what I want to do. I want to find the greatest common divisor of these numbers. Now, I want to go old school. I want to do it for the way we did it as kids. So we understand, first of all, what is our goal? What do I know absolutely works? And then are there shortcuts I can take? Because the algorithm itself does not come directly from the way we used to do it. So the way we used to do it, we talked about this yesterday, a factoring tree. So I would have started with 1,008. And what are the rules for a factoring tree? Do you randomly think of factors? Let me see if uh, 48 goes into this. No. What do you do with a factoring tree? You always start with what? Two. Two. And you do twos until you have no more evens, then where do you go? Three. <laughs> then five. You go actually in the order of the prime numbers. I mean, that, that's what you were supposed to do. So two and, what would this be? 504. And how about two and 252? So two and 126. Two and 63. So that'd be, what, seven and nine? Or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not seven, I'm sorry. Three and 21, and then that would be three and seven. My bad, almost went out of order. Do we all agree with that? So I can say then that 1008, it has a unique prime factorization. That's actually a powerful theorem. And the reason that's important is because it means no matter who's doing this problem, all human beings have to have exactly the same result. We like that. We don't want variations. I, I'll give you a simple example. Could you imagine having a calculator and you enter a you know, combination of numbers and you hit equals and it gives you a number? And then you enter the exact same combination of numbers and it gives you a different number. Now all of us are certain we've had that calculator, right? Well, no, we messed up the entry, but could you imagine entering the exact same thing twice and getting two different results? Right? Yeah, that would be awful. That would be terrible. You wouldn't trust your calculator. So what is the answer here? One, two, three, four. So 2 to the 4th times 3 squared times 7. This is called the prime factorization. This is unique. The order is unique because multiplication is commutative. So now let's do the same thing for 1296. So 2 and 648, 2 and 324, 2 and 162, 2 and 81, which would be 3 and 27, 3 and 9. I'm running out of room. 3 and 3. All right. So I'll write it here. 1296 is 1, 2, 3, 4. So 2 to the 4th, 1, 2, 3, 4, 3 to the 4th. So as a completely separate problem, if I said give me the prime factorization of each number, the old-fashioned factoring tree actually is the most efficient route to do the prime factorization. If you said, well, I can think of large numbers that multiply to 1296, that would be great. That, that's impressive, but that doesn't help because I still have to break each of those down. 
And eventually I have to get this. Now, what do we call the greatest common divisor? How do we determine that? I have twos, I have threes, I have sevens. How do you determine, the key word here is not greatest, the key word here is common. They have to have them in common. They both have twos and threes in common, agreed? So seven cannot be a common divisor because one of the numbers doesn't have a seven. So the greatest common divisor is what's the most number of that that they have in common? So the GCD would be what? Clearly two to the fourth and three to what power? Squared. Three squared, that's the most they have in common and that would be 16 times nine or 144. And now the way I know that's true, I know that's true because 1,008 equals seven times 144 and 1296 equals nine times 144. Okay, that's the ultimate proof. Now, tell me about seven and nine. There's another term, I used the term yesterday, do you remember? Mutually primed. They are mutually primed because they have no common factors other than the number one. Everything has a one in common. But wait a minute, I thought the whole point was to look for all the prime factors, yes. These are all the prime factors they have in common. Is one a prime number? It's not a trick question, it's, it's a definition. Is yeah. one a prime number? No. No. Why is one not a prime number? But actually, it does not follow the definition of a prime. Let me go the other direction. Are these two numbers prime or something else? Something else. Something else, good. What is the something else? What did they call it? Do you remember? Composite. Good. They are called composite numbers. Now, if every, if every positive integer, let's start with, think large numbers first. Every positive integer has a prime factorization. Okay, that's easy. But what if the number is 13? 13, isn't that a prime number? So what makes something a prime number? What are the only factors of 13? One and itself. The definition of a prime number is a number that has exactly two, two factors, one and itself. How many factors does one have? Itself. The only the one. That's why one is not a prime number because it, it doesn't have a second factor. So the first prime number is actually two. That confuses people, that gets people in trouble. So we said mutually prime because there are actually no prime numbers that are factors of both of these numbers. One is the only common factor, and one is before you get to a prime. So the term mutually prime does not mean the numbers are prime. It means they have nothing in common, basically. Everything has a one, but they have nothing in common other than a one. <clears throat> they have no prime numbers in common. That's an easy way to think about it, okay? If I stop short and I said, well, I, I got 36 as a common factor, or I got 72 as a common factor, those are true statements. They are common factors, but they're not the greatest common factor. Now, this process worked fine. What if these were six-digit numbers? <laughs> what if these numbers were really large? Do you realize that would be, this would be mind-numbing? That, that's, in other words, this is absolutely correct for the individual factorizations. Incredibly inefficient, though, if I'm trying to find a prime, or if I'm trying to find a, excuse me, a greatest common divisor. So we're gonna learn an algorithm, it's called the Euclidean algorithm. It's simple. I mentioned I actually used to teach this one in pre-algebra. Now, we would only do it for really small numbers, but all you need to have is a cheap calculator in hand. You do not need to do steps in your head. In fact, it's a bad idea to do steps in your head if the numbers are large, because you're going to make arithmetic mistakes. And doesn't matter how small your error is, <laughs> if at any point along the way, Let's say right here, you know, I said it's 2 times 314, or 334. In other words, if I factored right here badly, does that happen actually in real life, that people factor this badly? Yeah, because they're doing every step in their head. But what happens the rest of the way? The numbers are wrong. And therefore, my answer is incorrect. I can't afford any error whatsoever. So here's what it comes down to. I want to find the GCD of two numbers, A and B, and let's start by supposing that A is greater than or equal to B. It does not matter, but I need one of them to be the larger of the two. By the way, what if A and B are the same number? 
in of itself. Yeah. yeah, you're done before you start. That's the ultimate gimme. What's the GCF of a billion six and a billion six? Uh, I think the answer is a billion six, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's as easy as it gets. Do you agree? What's the GCF between a billion six and one? One. Oh, so that's the other easiest thing it can get. Everybody got that? So what I'm looking for here is not are they the same number, or I'm not even looking, what if one is a factor of the other? That's the freebie. The greatest common divisor of 5 and 10 is 5 because 5 is a factor of 10. So let's go to that step. If 5 is a factor of 10, that means there's no remainder. But 6 and 10 have a common factor, agreed? What would their common factor be? Two. 2. 6 goes into 10 one time and there's a remainder. It's about remainders that I want to get to. So if I, I would say, let's assume that A is bigger than B. So here's what I want. I want A mod B. Let's suppose that, let's just say hypothetically that C is equal to A mod B. Tell me about the size of C. It should be less than A. And even more specifically, it should be less than, if A was the bigger of the two numbers. It should be less than B. So I want to do, we just said, we just said, let's use 6 and 10 a moment ago. 10 mod 6 is what? 4. 4. It's the smaller of the two numbers. Remember, that's the denominator. Remember, so what can the remainder be? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. five. So do you all agree that the mod has got to be smaller than this number? This would be a strict inequality. Um, when we were talking about this, and Zachary pointed out, when I, when I was mentioning the mod, I said the mod can be anything from 0 up until the divisor, but I put a strict inequality. A lot of people think about it up to the divisor minus 1, and that is absolutely correct because they're integers. A strict inequality on integers means you got to go one less. So there's no difference if you said less than or equal to the divisor minus one, or just less strict less than the divisor. It's the same thing, again, because we're talking about integers. Okay, so it's got to be less than b. Could I also have said it's got to be less than or equal to b minus one? Could I have said that? Yeah. It's exactly the same statement. Does not matter as long as you realize. Okay, it's a strict inequality on. Because again, if I said 5 goes into 20 three times with a remainder of 5, it goes in two times with a remainder of 10. Well, those statements are correct, but my remainder is too big, isn't it? Because it goes in evenly. So the remainder can't be as big as the divisor. It can be only up to one less than the divisor. <coughs> so when I'm asking the question, in this case, let's say I'm going to put the bigger number first. I do this just so I don't have to think about it. Whenever I'm giving a common factor between two numbers, I just automatically put the bigger one first. Then I'm looking for that mod. Now here's the algorithm. This is equal to the GCD of B and C. That's the algorithm. You're gonna, you're gonna like this. It's equal to the GCD of B and C. Now what did C represent in this case? It was very specifically the remainder, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. How do you know when you're done? There have to be no remainder. Um, let's, let's put a new letter up here. How about, I don't know, X? If C always represents the remainder, I'm done when there's no remainder. Do you agree? I'm done when there's no remainder. So we're going we're to walk through the problem. You're going to like this. All you need is a cheap calculator. And you need a cheap calculator. Because otherwise, you're doing too many things in your head. There is nothing wrong with doing things in your head. I, I, I'm notorious for doing things in my head. I, I am impatient, though. If you've been in my classes long enough, you realize I've already got the calculation long before you guys got it on your calculator. I'm just waiting for you guys to finish out. Yeah, my brain works differently than everyone else. I literally, my brain works like a calculator in many cases where the calculation's done. I don't actually plug in the numbers. It's already done as I'm asking the question. I don't have to think about it. 
but I can't teach you how to do that, so you have to know how to do it on the calculator. And I, I'm not saying that jokingly. Even as a child, before I learned division, I would could convert fractions to decimals in my head and even come up with the infinite repeating decimal place as a child. I can't tell you how I could do that. <laughs> and I still remember decimal sequences from most fractions, you know, with denominators up to about, I don't know, 30. <laughs> yeah, I can't explain it, and I certainly can't teach it. It scares people. Okay, I want to do this. So I'm going to rewrite this because I said I like doing the bigger one first. Okay, how many times does 1,008 go into 1,296? That's easy. One. One, <laughs> okay. What's the remainder? That's easy, just take the difference. Everybody understand that's how you find the remainder? You simply take the difference between the two. So I'm gonna claim this is equal to the GCD of 1,008, and what's the difference? 288. 288, okay. Now how did I do that? Actually, that was 1296 mod 1008. I'm going to write it over on the side so you know exactly where the numbers came from because it's not always going to be as easy as just subtract those two numbers. Okay? Because now, how many times does 288 go into 1008? Here's where you want to use your calculator. This is the best part. If you use your fraction key on the calculator, not that, don't do a decimal, use your fraction key. I know that 288 goes into 1,008 more than once. Do you agree? And if I just simply enter as a fraction and a decimal, I'm going to get three point something. That's worthless because it's the point something that I need. But if I use my fraction key and I go 1,008 over 288, it's going to give me an answer as a fraction, and I can ask it to give me a mixed number. Everybody understand that? And it's the numerator of the fraction that I need. So can anybody tell me what that is? This is not complicated, and this is the part I'm telling you, don't do this in your head. There's no logic. This goes in three times, and if I do that three times, my remainder will be exactly what? 144. 144. Now, does everybody get that? How did you get that, Sam? I multiply by three. Don't, don't do it by pencil and paper. Yeah. Do it. Use a calculator. Why? Because sometimes the numbers are going to be astronomical. And, and if you do it pencil and paper, that's correct, but we might make mistakes. And it's the mistakes that I want to avoid. You're going to get the algorithm easily enough, but we won't always get the right answer. Okay, so now what is this equal to? Of 288 and 144, you know, like this. So, what is 288? mod 144? Zero. Zero. Do you all agree it's zero because it goes in twice? I'm not looking for the div. I'm looking for the mod only. I now should be at the end of the problem because we found a situation where there was no more remainder. I'm not done. I can't answer it yet. This, this isn't the answer. So what's the next thing? 144 and zero. This is when I'm finished. So therefore, the answer is 144. Was that our answer before? Yeah. Was this a little bit easier, though? Yeah, I didn't have to do a factory tree. In fact, did I factor anything? No. That's crazy. This is called the Euclidean algorithm. Is it hard? No. No, it's actually really simple. It's bookkeeping. How many steps does it take? <clears throat> yes. <laughs> it takes as many steps. You have no control over how many steps it takes. You just have to do all the steps. Can it take a lot more steps? Sure. What if my GCD was really small? I probably have a few more steps, don't I? Because it's whittling itself down as I go. You all with me on that? OK. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Let me call it easy. So I want the GCD of 611 and 
You never have to write it in a particular order, but like I said before, if you always put the bigger one first, always, then your final form will always have a zero last, okay? And again, if it's an algorithm, you really don't want to do it differently from one time to the next. You want to do it exactly the same. You become more efficient. I say this in all seriousness, and many of you have been in many of my classes. I tell you, when you're doing similar processes, you always want to do them exactly the same way. You will be more efficient. If you have a different way of doing every problem as you go, you're going to be scattered and you're not going to be certain. But if every time you're doing certain types of problems, you always do them the same way, you can start flying through. Right? You become more efficient. This is an algorithm that I could do this in any order I want. It wouldn't change anything, but I think it's easier to keep track of. So I want, and I'm gonna, this is, I'm doing the work off to the side, and this is a good idea. Okay? What is this? Now I'm gonna write even more this time. What is 611 mod 141? It's 47. Now, what does that mean to you? That means that 611 equals, how many times does this go in? If you did this on your calculator, it went in exactly how many times? Four times? Four times. So this is four times 141 plus 47. Do you all agree? That's exactly what you just said. It's not the four, it's the 47. So then I would say this equals the GCD of 141 and 47. So now what is 141 mod 47? Zero. Zero, because 141 equals three times 47 plus zero. That's my justification off to the right. Both things, I don't need you to put both things, but you have to understand that's where everything came, came from. The whole point of the mod is because this is a true statement, but it's only this part that I'm going to use. So the next thing I'm going to write is, is the GCD of what? 141. Careful, not 141. 47. You always take the smaller one and then the mod. Are we done? Yes. We are, we are now done with, with the algorithm. We're done. Why? Because the last number is a zero. And so therefore, my answer is 47. Don't answer it from here because you don't, you don't have a zero yet. Your answer is done here because 141 is not my answer. I, I can't answer it from here. I'm answering it from the non-zero number that remains, not from the bigger number that remains. This says there is no longer a remainder when I whittled it down. But could you imagine trying to do a factoring tree with these guys? That would be really icky because they're, they're icky numbers. And most of the time when you're doing the algorithm, it's, it's icky numbers. Okay. Let's keep going. There, there should be some what ifs. I'll hold off. Okay. Give me one moment here. I, I wrote it down on, on the computer. Sorry. This is why you want a calculator. Could you do this problem without a calculator? Absolutely. Should you? Mm. What am I literally doing in the first step of this problem? Literally. I'll give you a hint. 1427 is more than half of 2593. Do you agree? So therefore, it's only going to go in once. So therefore, your first step literally is to simply subtract those two numbers. That's all you're going to do. And if you make a mistake on the subtraction, the whole problem will go up in smoke. So have your calculator out. Don't make a mistake on the subtraction. Sometimes it's really easy to see. Um, I can see that that's bigger than half. Therefore, this is going to be 1. The div is 1 with the remainder of what? What's my remainder? 1166, okay. So then this is equal to the GCD of 1427 and 1166. That's 
Now, one of the things I've noticed, and this is a good thing right now, on the last round of proofs, for example, we're about 90% the same. That's a really good thing. When you're looking at my answer key, many of you said that's verbatim what I wrote, literally term by term. That's a good thing, because that means your thought process is correct. Plus, I've done enough examples and things that hopefully you just, you know, sometimes I've just copied the examples. But the idea is you, you don't want to get creative. When you're writing a proof and there's a particular format, do it that way. Don't get creative. Every now and then I'll be looking at one going, what are you doing? Where are you going with that? I mean, like, <laughs> going is a weird tangent, yet the problem is maybe just two or three steps. But when we get the hang of it and we're doing it right, um, Zachary, you mentioned something yesterday. You said you're great as long as there's no deviation. But when we start deviating from the question, we make small changes in something, is your thought process correct in general that you can handle the deviations? Because in reality, if you can only do the problem that was asked in class, that's not good. You want to be able to do every version of it, which means you don't learn things based on the specifics. You learn things the general. I'm giving you an algorithm that has a general format, but we're going to do specific problems so you can see, okay, you know, in a few minutes, I should be able to give you any problem and you could all do it. But better yet, you all have exactly the same numbers at the same stage, right? Nobody's deviating from how we do it. So again, this is bigger than half, so clearly this goes in once. So off to the side, 1427s mod. Prettier. Is what? 361. That would be my remainder, which is simply the difference. Two, two, 261. Oh, 261. Sorry. By the way, what if we have a wrong number there? Which did? Yeah, the whole thing. It basically means I did a different problem. Right, I'm, I'm answering a completely different question because I had different numbers. So GCD of 11, oops, 1166 and 261. Okay, obviously that goes in more than once. So I can do this in my head or I can use my fraction key. Probably easier to use the fraction key. All right, this is going to go in four times. But what's my remainder going to be? Yeah, you're using your calculator, so. Whether you're inefficient or efficient with your calculator, you should, still should be able to do this. <laughs> 122. One, 122, good. Well, I, I can do that one in my head. That goes in twice, right? I can see that. So 261 mod 122 is... So I'm going to bring this over to here. It's what? Is it 27? 17. 17. 17. Yeah. Again, calculators. <laughs> yeah, I, I say this jokingly, and many of you heard me say this. Once you get to about Calc 3 and certainly differential equations, nobody has calculators anymore in the classroom. Dif uh, linear is the worst, because what are all the mistakes we make in linear algebra? Single digit arithmetic. But nobody uses a calculator because at that level of math, a calculator is a sign of weakness. And I'm not joking. That is literally the thought process of everybody in the upper level classes. If I need a calculator, that's weak. No, it's really lame that you're flawless at the math, but you get a wrong numerical answer because you refuse to do the calculation on a calculator. <laughs> when we're doing simplex method, all of the errors are bad addition of fractions, aren't they? <laughs> not, not the big picture, just really bad arithmetic because we won't use a calculator. No, nah, I'd use a calculator because otherwise it might mess it up. So what is the next one? It's the GCD of what? 122 and 17. So now I got 122 mod 17. Well, that's going to go in seven times with a remainder of three. All right. Beauty. So this is now the GCD of 17 and three. All right, so three goes into 17, how many times? Five. I think five times with a remainder of two. two. I don't need a calculator for that one. All right, I'm pretty good with that one. So GCD of three and two. All right, so three mod two is 
one. So now I am GCD of two and one. I'm still not done yet. <laughs> oh my gosh, Matthew's laughing now. So I have two mod one, and that is zero. <sighs> Are we there yet? Yes. What's the answer? One. What does that mean? Somebody tell me what that means. They're mutually prime. Yeah, even worse. They're both prime. <laughs> I, I have a chart of prime numbers over on my computer. I didn't do that in my head. Are you kidding me? Those are both prime numbers, which actually ensured the answer was going to be a one. Could you have possibly known that? Well, some of you have memorized the first thousand primes, right? You know that, so that would have been easy. Yeah. If we notice a prime number on the right, is it always going to be one? I'm sorry, like if we got to 17, if we... Oh, if the one on the right is... Um, well, no, because it may turn out that 17 is the common factor. Okay. It's on the next round. That, that's the thing. It is on the next round, it may be. Um, you will see patterns. Now, I, I did this one on purpose because you could not have done this in your head. Oh, by the way, factoring tree, that would have been a blast, wouldn't it? I gave you two four-digit prime numbers. So you would start your factory tree with two, no, three, no, five, no, seven, no, 11, no, 13, no. So, when do you stop, by the way, on a factory tree? Does anybody know what the rule is? I used to teach us in pre-algebra. When you get to the square root. When you get to the square root. Now think about this logically. You, you're, you're got a 30, all right? Five works, it goes in six times. Six works, it goes in five times. The square root of 30 is somewhere between five and six. But you can't have a number bigger than five and your factoring tree at that point. Does that mean, in other words, the largest the factor can be in a factoring tree is the square root of the number, because then you're on the other side of the number in a sense. But if you were trying to do this, you know, two, three, five, seven, on and on and on, you'd have been doing this for a really long time ago. Nothing's working. Now the problem is, is that you'd start questioning, am I doing this right? If I said factoring tree, you all realize we'd spend a lot of time on each one and we, were, we wouldn't be sure. Well, I gave you two prime numbers. You can't look at a number and tell me it's prime. You can only show me it's prime by exhausting all the possible prime factors up to the square root of the number. That is actually the, the only way. Yikes. So I just went to, you know, online and grabbed some large primes. The point being, it's not the fact that they were prime. It's what Matthew said. They are mutually prime. The two numbers didn't have to be prime to start with. That wasn't necessary. But they had no common factors other than the number one. When will I know that? Only here. So the, my original numbers, by the way, I chose two primes just to make this really easy. But I could have picked two numbers that were not prime. And let's start with a really simple example. I want to find the GCD of nine and eight. Neither one of those are prime. Nine is three squared, eight is two cubed. But we know they have no common factors. Agreed? Everybody okay with that? We know they have no common factors. So, 9 mod 8 is what? Is 1. So this is going to equal GCD of 8 and 1. 8 mod 1 is 0 because 1 goes into 8 8 times with no remainder. So this is GCD of 1 and 0. I'm, so that, in other words, my GCD was a 1. The numbers don't have to be prime to have 1 as your greatest common divisor. But that's the definition of mutually prime. They have no common prime factors. I, I don't like the term. We always use this in math. We say the two numbers have no common factors. Well, they have to have one common factor, right? So what do we always say? They have no common factors other than the number 1. We always throw that in as the disclaimer. I even do that. I would rather you say they have no common prime factors. Then it means one is the only common factor. Because one is a common factor no matter what I'm doing. One is always a common factor. It's not always the greatest common factor. In this case, it's the greatest common factor. So they have no common prime factors. Therefore, the GCD or GCF, I don't care which one you call it. You guys like this algorithm? It's kind of cool. But the, the cool part about this basically is it, it's great when the numbers are large. If I had two large numbers and I was asked to find a GCD, that would be really, really difficult. It really would be. Now, I'm going to show you another little 
a little trick that you may or may not have known. What is easier to find between two numbers? Two numbers only, by the way, not three. What's easier to find? The greatest common divisor or the least common multiple? Which one's easier, do you think? <laughs> That's tricky because you haven't done either one in a while. When do you typically use least common multiple? What's the most common situation you run into? Give you a hint. It starts with an F, ends with fractions. Fractions looking for a common denominator. Isn't that when we use least common multiple? And I'll give you a hint. Mathematically speaking, that's probably the only time in your entire life you've ever actually really used. Least. Yeah, when you're adding two fractions of unlike denominators, I, I'm looking for a common denominator. We prefer to use the smallest common denominator because it makes the rest of the math easy. I, I don't have to be the smallest. I just have to be a common. But it's, it's efficient to use the least common. So in general, if I wanted to find, sorry. Let's suppose I wanted to find the least common. Now, we usually say LCM, least common multiple, because we're not talking about fractions yet. The least common multiple, I'll use something simple. Um, Let's say 48 and 60, that's a pretty easy problem. Well, what did we do as little kids? Does this look familiar? <laughs> this is how you learned it as little kids, by the way. Is that the right answer, by the way? Yeah, that's the right answer. I'm doing multiples of each, and the first one that shows up in both is the answer. By the way, how long is that going to take this one? Well, the 1,427th multiple of this, or the 2,593rd multiple of this. You understand? That's when they would finally cross paths. Is that a really good way of doing it in general? That was a horrible way of doing it in general. So I'm going to show you a really, really cool one. I'm not, the, the proof of this is actually really simple, but do it on another day. This is something, by the way, this, the stuff I'm showing you, you, you're going to be kind of annoyed if you've never seen this before, because I actually teach this in the remedial algebra classes. They don't remember it. The GCD of A and B multiplied by the LCM of A and B. This is an absolute mathematical statement. Anybody know what it is? A times B. That's an absolute mathematical statement. It's true always. If you multiply the least common multiple by the greatest common divisor, if we agree that the greatest common divisor is usually easier to find, I'll give you a hint, it's always easier to find, then finding the least common multiple Now, this is for two numbers and two numbers only. More than two numbers, no. Totally different, unrelated problem. So if I wanted to find the least common multiple of these two numbers, can anybody tell me the greatest common divisor just looking at them? Is that fairly simple? There's a two in common, there's a three in common, there's a six in common, there's a 12 in common. 48 is 12 times four, 60 is 12 times five. Can you, by inspection, tell me that 12 is the greatest common divisor pretty easily? So then I can say the answer to this question is 48 times 60 over 12, which is 240. Why is that helpful? Because you're doing a problem in, in calculus, maybe. You know, you've got x over 48, and you're adding it, I don't know, y over 60. You know, you're doing something like that. We know that if I simply multiply these two, that will give me a common multiple. We know that, don't we? When I'm doing this list over here, won't I eventually get to 48 times 60? And over here, won't I eventually get to 60 times 48? But won't there have been several numbers that came earlier that were matches? Yeah. You can always multiply these together. That's absolutely correct. There is no such thing as you have to use the least common multiple. The reason you always want the least common multiple, you'd rather work with smaller numbers. It's easier. Why do you reduce roots as you go? So you have smaller numbers that you're working with. It makes the rest of the process simpler. 
So if I said, well, what is a common multiple? Well, we agreed that 240 was a common multiple, but not because I figured it out the long way. It was because I just did this. It's way easier. So this is a nice little trick. This, isn't, this one isn't in the text. Like I said, how many have ever seen this before? Be honest. How many have seen this identity? I actually teach this in pre and elementary algebra when I used to teach those classes. Because we had to, we had to do this kind of stuff all the time. When they're working with um, adding quotients that involve variables, ooh, that's, that's a tricky one, right? Yeah, x plus 3 is one of my denominators. You know, x squared minus 9 is my other. They have a common factor. We had to learn how to do things like that, rational functions in general. And you're going, really? No one showed me that? It's, it's cool, but it's also ridiculously simple to apply. All right, now I move on. The next thing we're going to do, it's going to be a flashback. For some of you, it might present nightmares. Sequences, and then loosely, there's going to be some mention of series. Very, very loosely. That's not the emphasis. The emphasis is on sequences. And the reason I'm saying loosely, because some of the questions in the text, the author will ask some partial series. You know, now that I have the sequence, add up the first five terms, add up the first ten terms. That, you know, that kind of stuff. That's not, that's not complicated stuff. Sequences. Okay, I teach Calc 2. Many of you were in Calc 2 with me. Calc 2 is a, I, oh, it's a cool subject, but a lot of people, they didn't love sequences and series because all they did was do sequences and series. They never used them to answer questions. They didn't do bigger stuff, unfortunately. So you, you did all of the dirty work. It'd be like saying in linear algebra, I just kept doing things like finding determinants and multiplying matrices and stuff, but I never actually got to the cool stuff at the end of the course where I'm actually answering questions. I'm just doing the algebra. What is a sequence? This is, a, this is not a tricky thing. I, I've seen this defined in many, many textbooks incorrectly. Whew. So I'm going to ask you a question. Um, I'm just going to write down a finite number of numbers. Are these all the same thing? By the way, I could put comma dot dot dot. Then that, that would make it infinite. A sequence by definition is actually infinite. I'm just writing down a few terms. Are these the same things? OK, then let me change the question. Are any of these the same thing? Which ones? Last two? Good. Why? Order doesn't matter. The last two are both sets. And again, this makes it easier if you think of it this way. I have a roster for this class. It is a set of names and nothing more. I have it in alphabetical order just because it's convenient that way. But I've decided, I think the next time I do it, I'm going to go tallest to shortest. So I think, Benito, you finally moved to the top of the list. And whoever's shortest in here is going to be at the bottom. Or I could do it by age. I could do it by you know the most beautiful person. No, that'd, that'd be that'd be bad because I'm not going to judge of that. Um, is the order I put the names relevant, or is it just the list of names? The last two are sets, so the order is completely meaningless. It's just make sure you got those three numbers. Those are your these are three people. A sequence order is everything. These are completely different. Why? In a sequence, there is a first term. The first term of this is one. The first term of this is three. Those are not the same numbers. So a sequence, first of all, the order matters. So in a textbook, in a calculus book, I love this. this the typical definition will be something like this. A sequence is a set of numbers that has a one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers. Now that part's correct, but they always use the term set, which is absolutely incorrect, because set immediately removes order as being relevant. And we know order is critical. A one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers, that's what's in every calculus book. How does that help me? Well, what are the natural numbers? Start, start it for me. One, two, three, four, five. That means there's a first term, there's a second term, there's a third term. There's not a three-fifths term or a root seven term. There's a first, second, third, fourth, fifth term. Now, those terms can be any numbers, but there is clearly a first term. That's what the one-to-one -one correspondence means. But it is not a set. It is a list. An ordered list. So the definition I always give in Calc 2 is I say an ordered list. I remove set. Why? Because in a sequence, you never use set brackets. No. 
because that immediately removes order from the thing. It's an ordered list. Now, I could give you a sequence, and by the way, you have to understand what the point of sequences are in general and where we use them. We're just, we're just doing a little bit. We're going to do this a few times. So I'm going to give you a sequence. First of all, what does dot, dot, dot mean? Now, in sequence, this is actually where this term is, or where this symbol is used most in all of mathematics, is in a sequence. How do you interpret the term dot, dot, dot? First of all, when does it stop? It doesn't. doesn't. So dot, dot, dot would mean infinite. Ooh, this is a tricky one. The way I like you to think of dot, dot, dot is, could you tell me the next number? Does somebody pull out your calculator? Can you punch in root two on your calculator? Tell me, tell me some decimals. One four one. Uh, one four, four one four two, one three five six six eight. Okay. I put equals. Is this correct? First of all, no. This is an infinite non-repeating decimal sequence that I've just rounded off to this point. Okay, but I really like to be equal, so I need the next number. Can anybody tell me what the next number is? Now, without technology, you can't tell me the next number is. Would this be correct mathematically for me to put that here? Actually, it is. It's infinite. Can anybody tell me the next number here? Come on, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Is it possible it's something else? Actually, no. Well, I'm going to talk about that part also. You all agree it's 12? Could you tell me like the next seven numbers? Heck, could you even tell me the thousandth number? You, you could figure out what that is. Can you tell me the next number? No. Dot, dot, dot means two things. Infinite, and it means if a clear pattern has been established, then that pattern will continue forever. That's, that's the most important part of dot, dot, dot. If no pattern has been established, then there is no pattern. This is an irrational number. We know there's no pattern, right? There's no repeating of the decimals, things like that. This is a clear pattern. So dot, dot, dot means infinite, but also has to do with patterns. So the way I like to define it is Mr. Brown's definition of a sequence. A sequence is an ordered, an infinite, ordered list of numbers that has an underlying pattern. There are an infinite number of sequences that have no pattern. And how much time do we spend on them in real life? None. Why? Because they're utterly worthless and I cannot do anything with them. I cannot make any conclusions. If I didn't have technology, it would be utterly worthless trying to spend time guessing what the next number is. This is a sequence of numbers, by the way. It goes forever. But since there is no underlying pattern, I'm not going to work with this one. Now, rational numbers that have infinite decimal sequences, do we have an underlying pattern for those? Yeah. And so you can always tell me what the next number is. That's the whole key. If you can't tell me the next number or figure out a way of finding it, then that really isn't a very useful sequence. So even though there's an infinite number of sequences, we're really only interested in the ones where we can figure out the pattern in the next number. That's what you did in Calc 2. In fact, that's what you did in differential equations if, when you solve things using power series. How many have had differential equations? You've completed it. All right, so when you use power series, right, you had to figure out a pattern, but otherwise, you have the worst possible answers. You answer something with plus dot, dot, dot. We hate that answer because we couldn't figure out a pattern. And by the way, that's often the case that we don't see a pattern. But if we do see a pattern, life is good. Now, I'm going to show you some of the basic rules before we move on. All right, I am thinking I have a sequence in mind. You see a clear and obvious pattern here. You see a clear and obvious pattern. Can anybody tell me what the next two numbers are? 8 and 16. 8 and 16. Great. Um, does anybody else see a very clear and obvious pattern that's not 8 and 16? 16. 16. 16. But it's, it's, no. it's added in place. 16, 16. 7, 11. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. oh. Houston, we have a problem. Sequence has to be unique. By the way, are both of these valid answers? Yeah, what, what did you do in the first one? You kept doubling. What did you do in the second one? You added one, you added two, you added three, you added four. That's a clear identifiable pattern. 
So why were there two sets of answers? Simple. And by the way, I, this is the kind of stuff I think about. I only give you three numbers. In general, unless I gave you the same number three times, it's actually not possible to be certain of a pattern of less than four numbers. That's actually a simple rule. Some textbooks will bring it up, some textbooks won't. If I had given you, if I had given you the fourth number here, now do you know what the sequence is? Yes, you would not have questioned it. But I didn't give you this. So is it possible that I've given you the first five numbers? Is it mathematically possible that the next number is not 32? Is that possible mathematically? Could we come up with an algorithm that produces the numbers that is so wacky, weird, chaotic, maybe some weird, you know, high level polynomial that it produced these as the first few numbers and then the next number was, you know, root seven or pi or, is it possible mathematically that we could come up with a sequence where the next number was actually not 32? Yes. What is the probability of that? It's not zero, but it's close. We say it's implausible. That does not mean impossible, that means unlikely. In, in other words, it ain't gonna happen. How many have heard the philosophical term Occam's razor? I always use that at this point. What, in simple English, what does that mean? We say all, else be, all things being equal, the simplest solution is gen yeah, it's not only the best, it's generally the only solution. So in other words, if you've seen a clear identifiable pattern, is it conceivable there actually is a different pattern? Yes, but is that actually gonna happen? No, <laughs> no. It, it would be, it, it might take a mathematician most of their life to come up with that formula that actually produces the weird thing. No, so in other words, the thing that is obvious, you have to assume that is the answer. Problem was, until we had the fourth number, though, we didn't have the obvious. That was my point. So once I see the clear identifiable pattern, I'm good to go. I don't need everything else. Now, this is if I'm doing pattern recognition. More often than not, like in Calc 2, you were already given the function that generated the pattern, weren't you? So in the first case, I might have said my nth term is 2 to the n minus first power. So when n is a 1, my first term is 2 to the 0. When n is a 2, my, my second term is 2 to the first. When n is a 3, my third term is... If I had given you this, do I need to give you any of these numbers? No. Uh, what's the 100th term? 2 to the 99th. By the way, do we prefer this? Do we always have this? No. Sometimes we have to figure this one out. When you did Taylor series in Calc 2, you had to figure this one out. When you were using power series solutions and differential equations, you had to figure it out. And it is not always clear identifiable. So if I give you a sequence and I'm asking you to tell me the general term, that's a little bit tricky at times. Now, the way we generally think of a sequence is like this. It's A1, A2, A3, dot, 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 AN, dot, dot, dot. The AN is the most important. We call that the nth term or the general term. If I have that, I don't need to tell you any of the numbers. I have all the numbers. I have every single possible number if I have AN. Because think of that as, as a function. But if I don't have AN, I might have to figure out AN. So let's suppose I gave you the following uh, sequence. Zero, three, um, 8, 15, and I said, can you see a general pattern here? Hmm. Can you tell me an A-N? Yeah. No, but 8's not odd. Okay, okay. And by, okay, what do you think the next number is then? 24. Good, it is 24. But I need the hundredth number. So I could do it by doing it one at a time. It's not very efficient, but it's legal. And there is a clear identifiable pattern here, but it's not hitting you over the head. It's not in your face yet. What do you think, Casey? Um, N squared minus one. Exactly. That, that's, you get 100 miles for that one. Oh, some of you don't know that. You, you guys know I give out airline miles for really good answers or sometimes good questions. Um, I give out a lot of airline miles. I've had people that actually kept track of them and said they've they earned like 1,000. I think you at least 
at least a couple of times you got a thousand miles, didn't you? Yeah, they're not redeemable and have no cash value, but it makes us feel really good when we, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Sometimes you have to think out of the box. Does everyone see it now? Every one of these numbers was one less than a per, the perfect square. And that wasn't obvious. But the problem is if I don't do this, I can't tell you the remaining numbers. I have to find them recursively. And that was my next thing. We do not like recursions mathematically in general, but sometimes we don't have a choice. So a recursion, a recursion would be something like this. A n plus one equals three times a n. Can you tell me the hundredth number here? Well, only if I know the 99th number. Do you agree? Oh. And the first number is two. I need a first number. Can you now tell me the second number? Six. Yeah, it's three times two. You all agree with that? Can you tell me the third number? It would be three times that, wouldn't it? Can you tell me the fourth number? Can you tell me the nth term? Only because I wrote out those first few, you could tell me the nth term. What do you think it is? I'll write it two times. Three to the n minus one. And that's exactly correct. This is useful. Here's why. I need the hundredth number. If I use the recursion, I can tell you the hundredth number, but I have to produce the first 99 numbers. I can't give you the hundredth number until I know the 99th number, which I need to know in the 98th and so on. We don't love recursions because they take too long. If I'm doing things on a computer, I really don't like recursions. Because if I want the hundredth number, the computer has to compute the first one. Then it has to compute the first two starting over. Then it has to compute the first three starting over. <laughs> so to compute the hundredth number takes a lot of calculations, tens of thousands of calculations. I don't want to do that. I'd rather just go directly to it. So this is a general formula. This is a recursion, okay? Now, if you're given a recursion, sometimes you can find the general case. Probably most of the time you can't. Now, you saw a pattern here, but it wasn't clear and identifiable. I'm never gonna ask you, given some obscure pattern, can you see it? That's something I cannot teach you, believe it or not, okay? That, that's, you saw it. You might not see the next one, or maybe that's, Maybe that's what you are really, really good at. Does anybody know what that is called? There's a branch of mathematics devoted to exactly what Casey just did. I'll give you a hint. The, the slang term for it is called code breaking. There's an entire branch of mathematics devoted to this. It's called cryptography. Who works on code breaking? Any computer science here? Are you trying to hack the computer? No, you're trying to make it more secure. You're trying, if you know code breaking, what are you trying to do? Come up with codes that are really difficult. Not impossible, ain't gonna happen, right? But really difficult to break. What's another slang term we use for that? It's called a firewall. Yeah, I'm not a computer science and I know this kind of stuff. So code breaking is the ability to identify patterns that are not clear and obvious so if you're a computer scientist, one of your main goals if you're in cybersecurity is to create coding that is extremely difficult to break. Again, nothing's impossible. Everybody's gonna figure it out eventually, right? Do you remember when the, a um, few years ago when the credit cards came out with the chips, when they first came out a few years ago, the credit card companies told us you're not, they're not gonna be able to steal your code. And I had one particular card alone, I have a lot of cards, I had one particular card Four times that year, they contacted me and said, your card's been compromised, we're gonna send you another one. I said, I thought the whole chip reader thing made it impossible because it's supposed to scramble it every time. Yeah, but the bad guys had figured it out. They said, basically, if you go to a gas station, most gas stations, they will have it because they've figured out, bad guys have figured out how to steal your code. Now, the new one is the bleep. I love that thing, right? The bleep. Bleep. And now that one's supposed to be impossible to steal for, for a little while. The chip was supposed to be impenetrable, and in my entire lifetime, I had never had as many compromised cards as I did the first year. I had one card four times. Overall, I had 12 cards, or 12 times I got card, that my card's been compromised, because if you have a chip reader, but you do the slide, absolutely they have it. Every time you ever slide your card, they have everything. So you've been to places where they had an old-fashioned machine, they didn't have the chip reader, so you had to slide it. Guess what? 
They got everything. Now, how honest are they? <laughs> so the point with code breaking is you're trying to design something where it's harder to break. Maybe it'll take people you know, a few years, and then we'll come up with the next thing. But I'm just giving you a very simple example of where this type of <clears throat> mathematics, the big picture, is used. Um, how many have ever seen the movie A Beautiful Mind? I love this reference. Uh, Russell Crowe played the mathematician John Nash. No one's ever seen it? It's incredible. Raise your hand if you said it. I'm just curious. Just, okay, a few of you have. It's based on a true story. Yeah, it's, it's a Hollywood movie. So through probably a few unfactual things. John Nash just died in the last few years. He was, I think he was like 90. He was a, a genius beyond, you know, beyond competition. I, I remember one of my favorite scenes in the movie. It's during World War II. He was a code breaker. That was his gift. And there's a whole bunch of these super mathematicians all together they, that the government had hired you know, to do a lot of this. And, and it was really funny because one of his associates said to him, isn't it good enough to be a genius? Do you have to be the most genius? And he's, yeah. <laughs> that was his attitude. Yeah, he, he was maybe the smartest person on planet Earth at that time. And, and he lived with Einstein alive and stuff like that. His genius was beyond the charts. He had one real small problem. You guys remember what it was? During the movie, you know, his best friend for his whole life um, imaginary. was imaginary. Yeah, he, he found out as an adult. He had already been teaching at the university. He was schizophrenic. And most everybody important in his life, other than his wife, were imaginary people. He didn't realize that. <laughs> yeah, he was severely schizophrenic. And yeah, it was very interesting. Um, it's, a, it's an incredible movie. <laughs> but John Nash's gift, and if you've seen the movie, it's unbelievable. Cause the, 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 U.S. military had hired him. There, there's a wall. It's one of my favorite scenes. There's a wall. They've intercepted, you know, Nazi codes. Again, yeah, this is World War II, and there's literally thousands of symbols on the wall. You know, numbers, letters, symbols, and they have no idea what to do with it. And John Nash walks in the room, and he could see things coming off the board, and he could see literally with tens of thousands of symbols in front of him. He could see the pattern. Now, you can't teach that. And human beings in general don't have this ability. He had this ability, and because of it, we were able to break Nazi codes, and that had a lot to do with, you know, victory in the war. Now, the irony is a few years later, another movie came out about, uh, it's called The Imitation Game. Oh, yeah. Anybody see that one? And what's really interesting is it's the exact same time period. It's World War II, but it's now over in England, and Benedict Cumberbatch plays the role. I don't know the mathematician's name. And He's basically doing similar things. Alan Turing. Yeah, Alan Turing. Turing. Alan Turing. Alan Turing. He's basically doing similar things on the other side of the pond, which is really interesting. And he was tortured in a different way. And, and, and it's, it's very interesting that two of the smartest people of the 20th century were doing basically similar things at the same time for different countries. You know, and, but the idea of code breaking. I can't teach you how to see patterns. I can show you how to see obvious patterns. And in Calc 2, that's what we do. In Calc 2, we, there's always patterns, right? Often they're geometric, often they're factorial, other things. They're easy stuff. That's not our goal in this class. Our goal is to manipulate things when we actually have clear, identifiable patterns. So if I gave you a sequence, and I gave you the general term, and I said, all right, a n is going to be you know, 3 n squared plus 2. Can you give me the first five terms? This is pretty much oh duh, right? This is not mathematics we should struggle with. But the idea is do I understand, okay, this is going to generate everything. Now, what am I doing with these terms? What, what are you often doing with the terms of a sequence? What's the follow up? And see, you always learn sequences first, then you learn the other S word <laughs> series. What is a series? It's a simple definition. It's a sequence where you're adding every term. It's you're adding the terms of the sequence. Well, if a sequence is infinite already, then a series must be a sum of an infinite number of terms, which always makes me laugh because they always say in the textbooks, we're going to work with infinite series as opposed to those other ones, right? So in geometry, we're going to work with the straight line today. Why does everyone say straight line? If it's a line, is it possible for it not to be straight? <laughs> in other words, when you hear the infinite series, it's like, but a series is infinite. The name series means it's an infinite sum of numbers. But what if I only want a handful of the numbers? That's not a series. We call that a partial series. 
So if I said, this is the series, okay? And we usually just use an S. But what if I didn't want all of the terms? What if I only wanted some of the terms? Maybe I'm doing a Taylor series and I only want the first handful, I don't know. Is there anything wrong with this statement that I'm asking right here on the right-hand side? It is no longer a series, it's the sum of the first 100 terms of that series. So the, the expression we use is the, this is the 100th partial sum. And often it is the case that we don't want all of the terms. We want a certain number of the terms. That makes it easy. This one's a heck of a lot easier to do on the computer, isn't it? <laughs> now, how do, you, how do you put a series into a computer? Eh, it's just a do loop, right? Right, well, one to 100 do, give it a formula, ask it. That, that's trivial. I'm not worried about the programming aspects of this. Why am I not going to ask this one on the computer? Oh, uh, maybe, but worse, I'll, I'll get a, <laughs> just keep running because I'm asking to add up an infinite number of things, and this thing is diverging to infinity. That's that's not a good question to ask the computer. But what if I asked you, you know, that question? Ooh, that's probably finite because those terms are getting really small. So that's what we in calc two we look at things of that nature. Again, right now we just want to know the the basics. How do I write things? And if I was asking you to add up the first handful of terms, so I want to go over a couple things. One of them is the bonus problem last day. Um, um, by the way, I started it jokingly. Some of you did it and you did it well, but you used up, you wrote a book, and then you look at the answer key, and I have like two steps, three steps, because we, we made it really complicated. It didn't need to be. But some folks said, well, how do I prove that? No, you didn't have to prove that. I'm telling you. This result is true, write the answer as a rational number. The result was true, but how do you know the result is true? Well, this is a formula that we probably learned in remedial algebra. We definitely reviewed it in Calc 2, probably haven't looked at it since. So I want to go over two very basic types to show you where we get the partial sums, because that's some of the questions you're going to be asked. So let's start with a simple one, an arithmetic Sequence. An arithmetic sequence. I'll we'll start with this. 2, 5, 8, 11, 14, forever and ever. Tell me something about this. What's jumping off the page at you? It's increasing by 3. It's increasing by 3. I'm adding 3 to every term. That's what makes it arithmetic. So the formal definition of an arithmetic sequence is that the n plus first term minus the nth term is a constant. And we usually use d for difference. You with me on that one? So if the first term is a 2, then the second term is 2 plus 3, and the third term is 2 plus 2 times 3, and the fourth term is 2 plus 3 times 3. Can you tell me the nth term? This is a recursion. I'd like to know what's the 1,000th term without having to find the first 999. By the way, can someone take a quick peek on that and make sure we're, are we still good? I think so, yeah. <laughs> you didn't just change it, I hope. <laughs> okay. Can anybody see it? Do you see it on 2 plus? Three times n minus one. You all agree with that? I, I didn't have to do very many terms. Here. Oh, I keep adding another three, but the number of threes is one less than the index, because my first term didn't have a three yet. I didn't have three till the second. And so if I distribute that, I'll get three n minus one. Now let's do a quick double check. When n is one, I'll be three minus one or two, okay. When n is two, I'll be three times two minus one, which is five, okay. When n is three, I'm three times three minus, okay. This is correct. Way more useful than this, do you agree? So this is what's called an arithmetic sequence. What if I wanted to add up a certain number of terms? Not the infinite sum, because that would be infinite. 
But what if I wanted to add up the first 50 or 100 or 1,000? I'll give you a simple example, all right? So Mandy just got a new job, they're giving her a base salary, and they said, we're gonna give you raises of a particular dollar amount every year you work here. We're, we're, it's gonna be a fixed dollar amount. First of all, could you figure out what your salary is in 20 years? Yeah, you'd have 19 raises of that amount, that's easy. Could you figure out how much money you've made at the company over 20 years without having to add up each individual year and calculating them separately? You see what I'm getting at? Oh, Nandy's actually a dunadine. You don't realize this. Like me, right? We're, we're, we're both 87 years old and we're gonna live a couple hundred more years. So you're working in this company for a couple hundred years. You don't wanna write down what you made every year and then add them all up. That would take you a really long time. Is there a simple algorithm to finding the sum of this? Yes, it's actually a really important one. You use this in actually in Calc 1, one of your summation formulas. So I'm going to show you it in a moment. Okay, this is one of my favorite legends. Now, a legend is a story that may or may not be true, but it doesn't even matter if it's true. It's the point of the story. I, I trained and I taught martial arts for 40 years. How many of you heard of Funakoshi? Funakoshi was the Japanese, he was actually Okinawan, he brought karate to Japan in the 1920s. People think karate's been in Japan forever. No, it was in Japan 20 years before it was in the United States. It was in Okinawa for a few hundred years, but Okinawans were looked very down upon in Japan at that time. He was a peasant teacher, he brought it. Now, the, the legend goes, he, he developed one of the stances called the horse stance by standing on the top of his, his house during uh, hurricane slash typhoon and he was fighting the hundred mile narrow winds. That's the legend. It's more likely he was just drunk and wandered to the top of his roof and you know tried not to fall off. In other words, did he really try to test out his stance during a hurricane on the Probably not, but it doesn't matter because it's such a good story and in, in his life story, you know, there's a book about his life story. He tells the story and, and, and you know as if this is you know the, the way you do things. I don't think so. <laughs> So, one of my favorite stories, my, my favorite mathematician, little Carl Friedrich Gauss, some of you know this story, because it's actually in most of the textbooks, a version of this. <coughs> Carl Friedrich Gauss did most of the important work for linear algebra, the development for linear algebra, but he also did most of the important work for the development of calculus. There's him and Leibniz and Isaac Newton, a few are credited with major stuff. But he grew up in a time you know, a few hundred years ago, where all the people were in the one-room schoolhouse, you know, K through 12 kind of thing. Uh, there wasn't pens and paper. Paper hadn't actually been invented yet. You have to, <laughs> paper hasn't been around all that long. 200 years ago, there was things, papyrus. No, they didn't use paper, they used little chalkboards. Called them easels. And they didn't have pencil, they used a piece of slate, like chalk. That's how the, you worked in the schoolhouse. You know, literally a chalkboard. And he was, the story goes, little Carl Friedrich was apparently an obnoxious little snot, little kid, and was testing the teacher on a daily basis and the teacher couldn't stand him. Now, is that a true story? Who cares? But one day the teacher says to him, um, you know, to get him off, uh, I want you to add up the first million natural numbers. You know, some arbitrarily large number. That will keep him busy, you know, with his little slate one plus two plus three. Unfortunately, he comes back a couple minutes later with an answer. Their calculators were really terrible back then. Their calculators were a, a big, you know, sand pit with a stick where you could, you know, write in. Sorry. Mr. Spam. Okay, so how did he do that? Well, he, he noticed something. If I write these in reverse order. Nine, 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 eight. Plus, you know, three plus two plus one. I write these in reverse order, and then I add every single pair. What am I going to get for every single pair? Because these are increasing by one, these are decreasing by one. Shouldn't the sum always remain the same? And what was the sum in each case then? A million and one. Huh? How many times? How many million and ones do I have? A million. So the answer is, <laughs> I have to count my 
and zeros. Oh my goodness. The answer is a million times a million and one. Well, not exactly. Why? I just did it twice. Oh, so that's the answer. This is a formula in every calculus book, by the way. If you want to add up, okay, and we'll use an I. I equal one to N. One plus two plus three plus four plus five, stopping at N. What is the answer? What we just did. This is a very important formula. This is, this is in every calculus book. And then we're going to prove some of these differently. We're going to do the n, the n squared, the n cubed. We're going to do lots of them over the course of this course. This is a very powerful formula. But what type of sequence are my numbers? This is a partial series of an arithmetic series, isn't it? How come it's arithmetic? Because I'm adding one every single time. Oh, so what was the only thing that actually mattered? was the first and the last. So actually, the sum of the first n terms is simply the first plus the last times n over 2. This is actually the simple formula. In an arithmetic series, a partial series, you only have to need the first and the last. Why? Because you add the same number each time. It's actually pretty simple. OK, did, we love this. When do you first see this? Should have seen this in intermediate algebra. Should have seen it again in pre-calculus. Because those are two of the most important things you do in those courses or the series. And unfortunately, if you guys took those in Mesa College, you may not have done them. <laughs> you probably were drawing lines and, and, and factoring quadratics every semester. That's what people tell me they're still doing in pre-calc, right? Drawing lines and what you'd learned in pre-algebra, elementary, and intermediate. So you're probably really good at lines by now. Um, but yeah, you kind of need some of the other stuff. Now, that's, a, that's this one. This is not that important in the big picture, particularly the calculus picture. The more important one by far was the geometric. Now, what was geometric? We did one a moment ago. If I said to you n plus 1 equals r times n, that's the same as saying the ratio of consecutive terms is a constant r. And the r stands for ratio. If I have a sequence of numbers where this is true. So my number was 1, then a1r, then, whoops, then a1r squared, then down to a1r to the n minus 1. That would be the nth number, and so on. Okay, If this is what my sequence looked like, <clears throat> I would like to know how to add up the first n of them. Because if r is small, then I get a finite total that I can actually take a limit. I can do all sorts of cool things. Now, this one here, it's a little less obvious. But I can use some of the same kind of reasoning that little Carl Friedrich used when he was doing his arithmetic. I want to add up a1 plus, a1r plus, a1r squared plus, plus a1r to the n minus 1. That would be, that's called the sum of the first n terms. That's not the infinite sum, that's the sum of the first n terms. Okay? Well, adding them in a reverse order won't really help, will it? Because there's not a constant difference. But there is a constant ratio. So what if, what if I took every single term and I multiplied it by negative r? That would be the last term, correct? I threw one more in there just. Huh, why would I do something like this? Because now what happens when I add them up? Almost, almost every term cancels. What's left? Only. Oh, by the way, this would be negative r times this n. So when I add them, on the left side I have this. On the right side I have this. I, I say this is, we love this formula because what if n is really large? I'm off the hook for all the work in between. Well, on the left side I now have sn times 1 minus r. 
And on the right side, I have a1 times 1 minus r to the n. Therefore, what is the sum of the first n terms of a geometric series? It's a1 times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. And that turns out to be an incredibly powerful and important formula, particularly in Calc 2. Now, aren't these terms just going to grow without bound? Not if r is small. If I take a number between negative 1 and 1 and I raise it to successively larger powers, what's happening to that number? It's approaching what? Zero. Zero. Oh, that's why if n, or excuse me, if r is small, and this is, you remember this hopefully from Calc 2, if the absolute value of r is less than 1, r doesn't have to be positive, it just has to be small then S, which this is the one time in the course I'm going to do this, I apologize, I'm going to use a limit. This is true always, by the way. This is always true for series. The infinite sum is always equal to the limit of the partial sum. What often happens, though, is this often ends up being infinite. But what does this end up being? If R is small, then this term goes to zero. And my answer is simply a1 over 1 minus r, which is really, really, really cool. Okay, This is something, again, you used in calculus. So if I have a geometric series and the r is small, then I can ask for the infinite sum. So let's do one we've done before. I'm going to walk halfway across the room. Then I'm going to walk half of that. Then I'm going to walk half of that. I've got little marks on the floor, so I know exactly how far. Then half of that then half of that, and half of that. How long is it going to take me to reach the other side? You'll never do it. Well, how long? Forever. Forever. But in calculus, we actually have forever, don't we? we? We work with infinities in calculus. So what if I actually have forever? What if I do this an infinite number of times? Will I reach the other side, in, in a sense? If I added up those numbers infinitely many times, would they add up to one? Well, let's prove it. A half plus a fourth plus an eighth plus, I'm actually doing 2 to the n, all right? If n is 1, if n is 2, if n is 3, on and on and on. Is this a geometric series? Yes. What is the first term? What is the constant ratio? That's easy. It's also 1 half. Oh, therefore, what's the infinite sum? Well, according to that formula, it's 1 half over 1 minus 1 half, which is 1. If I add it up and I allowed it to add up infinitely many times, because I have time. I have the whole afternoon. Okay, So I, I added up an infinite number. Well, no, you can't calculate infinity. You, infinity can only be reached via a limit. But we know this is true. You, are you with me on that one? We know that's true. Is this a useful formula in general? Well, if the r is small. So if I gave you a handful of terms and I asked you for a partial sum, you could do that. That's Some of these uh, questions are in the text. Now, I do this in count two. I think I might do this in differential equations. I can't remember. But uh, this is one you can make some money at a, at, you know, next party you go to. You know. Whip out some math. You'll have the uninformed. Um, Not a limit, not approaches, identically equal. How in the heck 0.99999 is equal to 1, absolutely equal. So you want to make some money on your friends? I'm going to show you three different ways of proving this. Simple ways. Forever and ever and ever. So dot 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 means do I have a clear identifiable pattern here? Is that a geometric series? Yes, it is. This is a geometric series where my first term is 0.9 and my constant ratio is what? <laughs> I'm moving my decimal one place each time. So what's my constant ratio? 0.1. Yeah, you can say 110. Just leave it 0.1. So this is absolutely equal. Because it's a geometric series, I don't have to ever prove the geometric series again. That's an absolute. This is something that is foundational in calculus and DFEQ and a lot of geometry. 
So according to that, this is equal to what? 0.9 over 1 minus 0 0.1, which is exactly 1. There's your first place. Okay. Second one is a little more abstract, but I think it's, I like this one. I saw this one done one time at a conference, and the person didn't do a good job of explaining it, but I understood it. This is understanding the nature of series in general. If I said 1 minus 0.9, that's 0.1. If I said 1 minus 0.99, that's 0.01. This is 0.001. This is, or I should say, 0. As I keep increasing the number of nines, I'm increasing the number of zeros. Do you agree? So what is 1 minus this? Well, it's 0. Point, um, how many zeros are there before the first non-zero number? Well, how many nines are there? Infinitely many. So how many zeros are there? Infinitely many. Do you ever get to a non-zero number? No. You just said 1 minus a number is 0. That proves that 1 equals the number. If I said 1 minus x is 0, then x is 1. This is actually a... Because there's an infinite number of zeros, the number on the right is equal, identically to 0. Whoa. Okay. You like that so far? Now let's do the easy one. <laughs> there's an easy one? Yeah. What is 1 third? Yes? <laughs> that's the simplest. No, that's an absolute mathematical statement. What's messing us up is we're not using the fact that there's infinities involved anytime you have a series. We are not working with the infinities. We just want to be aware of the big picture. That's what you did in calculus and differential equations. You worked with the infinities. We're working with partials. But we have to understand there is a connection that goes back and forth. Okay? Kind of crazy, huh? Like I said, make some money at a party, you know, prove it to somebody, and I'll bet you. Um, one more type that I want to work with <coughs> excuse me, involves factorials. Okay? And we don't do a lot in this class with factorials, but I, I want to make sure that we understand a factorial, what, what the factorials are. So, n, so I had to do that, at least once a semester. Those of you who've had differential equations, you know what the gamma function is. The gamma function is an actual improper integral where the the factorials come from. They're a special case. They're the gamma function if I use a particular input. But what does this mean? First of all, n has to be what? Integer. Well, integer? It has to be a positive integer, first of all, to, for the definition. So this is n, n minus 1, n minus 2, all the way down 3, 2, 1. Suppose n is large. So if I said 5 factorial, that's 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. What if I said one factorial? I'd just be one. So then I'll the conundrum. Well, if I do zero factorial on my calculator, what's it going to output? One. one. So most people are told, well, that's just a definition. Don't question it. It just is. No, it's actually not a definition. It's a calculation. So if you've done the gamma function, if you do the gamma function to generate your factorials, if you calculate the gamma function, zero factorial integrates and calculates to the number zero. It's OK if you just memorize that result. But it's not an arbitrary definition. It is actually a calculated result. Zero factorial cannot be zero, because factorials can't end in a zero. If they did, factorials would be way easier if these ended in a zero, wouldn't they? Because <laughs> then your answer would always be zero. I can't have a negative number factorial. I can't have a fractional factorial. So that's factorials. OK, that's great. I want to use a different notation now. I want to, let's just say this one right here. Whoa. See, I used a sigma earlier. Whenever you see a sigma in a math class, what does that always represent? Summation. Summation. 
Yeah, I mean, you can see it in the series, but it always represents a summation. Sigma is a sum. What am I using here? I. <clears throat> I'm saying these are equal. What product. does this symbol mean? Well, product. Most of you have not used one of these because there wouldn't really be much of a reason for you to, but it, it is an important symbol. We will use it in this class. Not a ton. But this means the product from i equal 1 to 5. So it means 1, this is called the index or the counter, and we know how counters work. They increment by 1. This is not a variable. Why is it not a variable? Because a variable, you can choose the input. A counter, you don't choose the input. It just goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So on the key of the last quiz where I did that geometric series problem, if you go back and look at it, you go, oh, that was, that was just the formula for geometric series we added up the first n terms. And that's what we got, OK? A lot of you made substitutions, which were, by the way, which were OK. They were unnecessary, but they were OK. You said, well, let me call 4 to the n plus 1 you know, t. Well, but 4 to the n plus 1 is an integer because n is an integer. n is not a variable. n is the index. It's the exponent that I did, so it is always an integer. I, I didn't have to treat it as a variable. We don't treat indices as variables. So this means 1 times 2, 3, 4, 5. So the definition of n factorial is actually You know, so I didn't start at n because we're ending it in. This is the formal definition of a factorial. How many have ever seen it written this way? I'm just curious. Probably never. Isn't this easier, though? I mean, from an efficiency standpoint? Yeah. So if I have rules like that, Oh, okay. Now, there are summation rules we know when I have partial sums. The sum of summations is the summation of the sum if I'm going same beginning to end. Well, the same thing for these guys. The product of the pi's is the pi of the product, if you want to say it that way. There are some things that, that hold. I just want to introduce that notation um, because it also shows up. Um, let's see. This is one that we're going to use a little bit now and a ton at the end of the course. Combination notation. Now, I'm not going to do any combinations right now. I only want to introduce the notation. How many have had Math 119? Statistics. So you did that. I mean, you did factorials, you did combinations, you know those. We do a little bit in calculus to help us derive formulas. We don't spend a lot of time with them. A combination is a simple formula, but it involves the factorials. And we're going to be doing some really cool proofs later on in the course that involve combinations. But the idea here is, you know, there's 20 people in the room. I want to take uh, five of you to lunch. I'm going to take uh, you five. So does it matter if I chose you first, second, third, fourth, or fifth? No, you're one of the five. I want to start a basketball team. I'm going to pick you five. Does it matter what order I chose you? No. Now, I'm going to go to a different restaurant every day next week. <clears throat> now, does it matter what order I choose you? Well, on Monday, we're going to um, Ruth's Chris, and on Tuesday, we're going to McDee's. I think it matters what order I choose you, right? You want to be Monday, not Tuesday. What is it called when the order matters? Anybody know? There's a, there's a term that has similar. It's called a permutation. So you go, oh, yeah, they, they often go hand in hand. A permutation is when you put things in order. The word permutation literally translates as arrangement. To permute is to arrange. That's a verb. We don't speak that way. You'd be watching a sporting event, and they love saying, this, there are so many permutations of the following. And I'd say every time I've ever heard the term used in my entire life in a sporting context, it was completely out of place. It had nothing to do. <laughs> it's not even similar meaning, but you know, announcers love using big words because it makes them sound smart. <clears throat> no, it only makes it sound smart if you use it correctly. <laughs> so a combination is the following formula. It, we write it like this. N is the number of objects I have, distinct objects available, R is the number of selections I made. I got 20 people, I'm selecting five of you, okay? So first off, they have to be non-negative values, and R must be less than or equal to N. I can't say I have 20 people, how many ways can I choose 30 of you? <laughs> no, but I can say how many ways can I choose 10 of you, or five of you, or three of you? So does anyone remember, I'm just curious, anybody remember what the formula is? 
This is the formal notation we use. It just makes it easier. It's n factorial divided by n minus r factorial, r factorial. Okay? Now, I have 20 people in the room. I want to choose five of you. Do it on your calculator. Don't enter the factorials, just enter this. So on your calculator, what does the key look like? Does anybody know? It's, it's NCR. It's going to be one of these two. It doesn't matter, which it's the big C. Now, most of your calculators, it's a main function, and then the second function will be the big P, which is the permutation key, because combinations are far more common, actuality. So it means I'm going to go 20 key 5 equals. Now, if you have a more expensive graphing fancy calculator, you probably have to go through a series of menu options. Okay? How many have a calculator where you have to go through the menu? So what you do is you look for the PRB key, and the PRB key will give you choices of C, capital P, or just the factorial. And so then you just you go, P, you go 20, select the C, 5. It's a little more, not very much more. Okay, so what number did you get? Anybody? 15,504. Everybody got that? Do I list all the outcomes? Oh, heck no. That's just how many possible outcomes are available. Now, I've changed my mind. I don't want to take, you guys were really misbehaving the other day, so I'm going to leave 15 of you behind. There's 20 of you in here, 15 of you are going to be punished and you're going to be left behind. So what's 20 choose 15? How many ways can I do that? 15 probably. <laughs> it's the same answer, isn't it? Why is it the same answer? Because these have the same denominators. One of them is going to be a 5 factorial, one of them is going to be a 20 minus 5 factorial. In other words, 5 and 15 add up to 20. Oh, so one of the first identities we have is this is always equal to n choose so to choose five of you and to leave 15 of you behind is exactly the same calculation, isn't it? Now, I decided I want to bring all of you with me. I want to bring all of you with me. Do I need a calculator? How many ways can I bring all of you with me? One. One, and that's to bring all of you with me. But let's do it from a calculation standpoint. Hmm. You just told me the answer is one. Doesn't that verify that 0 factorial has to equal 1 for that to be a true statement? Yeah. There's 20 of you in the room, and I, I just don't have time today, so I'm not taking any of you with me today. How many ways can I do that? I'm not going to take any of you with me. How many ways? One, and that's to not take any of you with me. Isn't it going to be the same calculation, just those two switched? Ah, oh, so 0 factorial is actually a very practical term. When I'm doing a combination and I choose none or I choose all, the calculation will always have a zero factorial in it. And it has to equal one in order to make the calculation correct and make some sense. So this is a simple, a simple thing that we often use. And we're going to do things with this because we're going to manipulate certain things. We're going to do certain really cool identities. I don't know that we're going to do them yet in this class. Let's see. Mm. Now, um, I've mentioned this a few different times. I taught the GRE portion, of the math portion, sorry, of the GRE uh, test for many years over at San Diego State. And that test is basically algebra, geometry, statistics. The statistics part was fairly easy. Mean, median, mode, little bit of standard deviation, a lot of calculations, a lot of factorial kind of calculations. Now, this is where it gets a little bit dicey. So everyone pull out your calculator for a moment. Let's just do something fun. You know, let's do 60 factorial. And I want you to look at what the representation is. Now, I think we agree that 60 is not large compared to like, you know, infinity. Or even the biggest number around, you know, bazillion. That's just, 60 is not a big number. But what's 60 factorial? Does your calculator give you the answer? No, it gives you a really rough approximation. What does it say? What, read, read your answer. I got scientific notation, so I got 8.3209. Okay, times 10 times to the 10 what? To the 81. So I want you to make sure you understand how you're reading your calculator. This is, so the words we use, we say this is on the order of 10 to the 81st power. 
That is called an astronomical number. Now, again, I like people to understand what the meaning of words. Astronomical comes from what? Space. Astronomy. <laughs> astronomical would refer to distances to, you know, to objects out, out in outer space. That would be astronomical. What do we call it when it's lots of decimals? What's the other extreme? Well, infinitesimal. Now, they're kind of the same, you know, that's what we're talking about, you know, chemistry class, right? The size of electrons and things like that. A lot, of, a lot of zeros after the decimal place. Well, what if I want to do 70 factorial? So on your cheap calculator, tell me 70 factorial. On the order of 10 to the 100. Huh. Okay, you got a, you got a, you got a goofy answer. Okay, tell me 69 factorial. <laughs> that's, uh, on, that's what? One, roughly 1 1.2 times 10 to the... 98th? Is it roughly that? It's roughly that, yeah. 10 to the 98. True or false? This is, this is one of the most important pro uh, properties of factorials. Is that a true or false statement? True. 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 And could I say it's also 70 times 69 times 69 times in factorial? Yeah. Oh, so what's 70 factorial? Is it, it's roughly 1.2? 1.7. Oh, I'm sorry, 1.7. Sorry, my bad. 1.7 something. So 70 factorial is roughly 10 to the 100th power, roughly. So why did your calculator give you an error? Because most of your calculators will only go up to 10 to the 99th power, which is very limiting. So here's a question on the GREs. I need you to calculate 100 factorial over 98 factorial. And by the way, they don't have calculators. Well, they do. Um, how many had to take a placement test when you got to Mesa College? Back in the day, they used to do that. And you did it on a computer. Did anybody ever do that? You took your algebra placement on a computer. Yeah, years ago. Yeah, and, and you had a calculator on your computer screen. And it add, subtracted, multiply, and divide, and nothing else, and no order of operations. And that's the same calculator they have when they take the GRE. This test to get into grad school. Add, subtract, multiply, divide, no order of operations, certainly no exponents, and certainly no factorials. And they got to do this. This is a question on the GRE. Well, if you do this on your calculator, it's going to say overflow error. Now, I happen to have a TI-89 titanium. <laughs> it's, I love to tell about because it's such a cool term. Although nowadays I use Desmos, I don't use it anymore. And I can do this. I can go up to 449 factorial on my calculator, because that's on the order of 10 to the 999th power, but I can't do 450 factorial. Now, 450 is still not very big compared to infinity. So factorials were really limited as humans, and I need you to do this. How do we do this? Yeah, it's actually that easy. And that's the kind of stuff I would teach them in the class, was how to manipulate factorials, because you don't have a calculator that will calculate factorials but you want to get the answer. So this is one of the things I need you to be able to do, just simple manipulation of stuff, okay? Now I'm gonna leave it like that. This section is not about calculating, but about interpreting sequences and series and writing them out. In some cases, you're asked to add up some stuff. Not that complicated. But I would read this section if, if there's a little bit of rust, like you haven't done this in a really long time. I don't imagine anybody's gonna be terribly challenged by this, but you may not remember the details of some of this stuff. Okay, uh, can we go ahead and stop? And